Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a new series. Um, this is our second lesson in this new series entitled Christian Education, and this lesson focuses on the family. It's lesson number two in that series for October 10 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to be your children, to realize that we belong to a royal family, a family that will continue to persist throughout eternity. May we recognize the privileges we have of being a part of that family and never allow ourselves to be sucked away or, or tempted away from it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Think of all the instructions the children of Israel were given as groups and as individuals down through the generations about educating and caring for their children. When we think about learning from God, aren't we all ideally supposed to be learning from, every, from Him every day? Gary? From the earliest times, the faithful in Israel had given much care to the education of the youth. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood the children should be taught of his goodness and his greatness, especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel. Song and prayer and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. Fathers and mothers were to instruct their children that the law of God is an expression of his character and that as they received the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings, and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures were open to their study. That comes from Desire of Ages, page 69, paragraph 2. Every professional educator will tell you that the earliest, perhaps most important education takes place in the home in the very early years. Try to imagine in your mind what that first family was like. Jim? The system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God. Adam was the son of God. April, excuse me, wow. Well, Luke 3, 38. And it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. Ellen White, education page 33, paragraph 1. So did Adam and Eve take their children to the gate of the garden and converse with the angel or angels guarding there? Do you think that was possible? Yeah. What did the children think as they looked into the garden? They probably said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can imagine my children, I want some of that. <laughs> Can I have some of that fruit? What are we doing out here in the, yeah, these exactly. thorns and thistles? <laughs> That's right. What went wrong? We've already studied, studied the events described in Genesis 1 through 3.15. It is hard to imagine a story that started out with better circumstances and ended up so sadly, especially if you carry on to what Cain did to Abel. When Satan spoke to that snake or serpent, did the snake or serpent have any choice in the matter? Did that snake voluntarily accept the control of Satan? No. Or did Satan force himself on the snake? Yeah. What is, what is Satan's usual way? Force himself on anybody he possibly can, Deceive right? Deceive them. Yeah. Take control. Limit their freedom. We do not know much about the initial education of Adam and Eve, what they were given at the, their point of creation. Surely God implanted in, the brains their uh, in their brains the ability to walk and do many other things. How much information was implanted there? We have no idea. But knowing what was coming, God must have spoken to them. And Ellen White details this about the events which had already taken place in heaven, including the rebellion of Lucifer and the results. Angels of God and I'm quoting now, angels of God visited Adam and Eve and told them of the fall of Satan and warned them to be on their guard. They cautioned them not to separate from each other in their employment, for they might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. If one of them were alone, 
they would be in greater danger than if both were together. The angels enjoined upon them to closely follow the instructions God had given them, for in perfect obedience they were safe, and this fallen foe could then have no power to deceive them. God would not persist permit Satan to follow the holy pair with continual temptations. We've already talked about, we talked about that last week. The, that tree was there to limit Satan's ability to pursue them. He wasn't allowed to follow them all over the garden, up and down, back and forth, tempting them at every corner. He could have, he could have access to them only at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 39, paragraph 1, also Early Writings 147. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man through all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents, education, uh, page 20, paragraph 1. So, do Christian parents really understand the challenge they have accepted when they choose to have children? I had some young people I was talking to today, <clears throat> talking about the eventuality of having children. And one of them said, it, and how much does it cost to raise a child? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money these days, a yes, lot of money. Is. Well, do young people understand their responsibility to educate them in worship, Christian instruction, fellowship, evangelism, and Christian service? And here's a question I'd like us to re I'd like you to really think of out there, as we do here. If more individuals or more families were actively witnessing and the children could see their parents doing that and what the results would be, would the children be more interested in witnessing? I mean, why do our children not see active witnessing going on all the time? Yeah. Too much other competing things for people's time. Yeah. Well, review what we know about the story of Cain and Abel. Carrie? I'm reading from Genesis 4, verses 1 to 9. Then Adam had intercourse with his wife, and she became pregnant. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. You know what it says in the King James. No. Adam knew his wife. That's right. Hi, I'm glad to meet you, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, our, our, our Good News Bible says we need to be more, more, more specific here. Yeah. Go ahead. She bore a son and said, By the Lord's help, I have acquired a son. So she named him Cain. I'm going to interrupt again. You know that Ellen White suggests when Cain was born, they were hoping that he would be the Savior that would have been promised. Go ahead. Later she gave birth to another son, Abel. Abel became a shepherd, but Cain was a farmer. After some time, Cain brought some of his harvest and gave it as an offering to the Lord. Then Abel brought the first lamb born to one of his sheep, killed it, and gave the best parts of it as an offering. The Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious, and he scowled in anger. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling, but because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. And Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. Hmm. The Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know. Am I supposed to take care of my brother? This is from the American Bible Society, 1992 edition, translation. Mm, 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 mm. How could that first family experience have deteriorated to that? Yeah. I mean, a, from a perfect setting there in the garden, with perfect love, with God as their instructor and so forth, and now the their second son is dead. And that's all, about all we know of the results of that earliest family education. Yeah. Well, in order to gain some, well, that's not really true. Uh, the Bible goes on to say a little bit about Seth, which was the third son, and he ended up to be the, being the, the ancestor of the good people. 
In order to gain some idea of the ideal education, let us look at the example of Jesus himself. Now, that, that should be a good example, right? So think about the story. I'm not going to take time to... Well, I, let me just read this, because this is an important part. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, remember that, first of all, Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, uh, she was way past having periods, way past any chance of becoming pregnant, but she became pregnant, as promised by God. God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. He had a message for a young woman promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. By the way, the Bible says she was also a, a descendant of King David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you, and he has greatly blessed you. Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message, and she wondered what his words meant. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king, as his ancestor David was, and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, I'm a virgin. How then can this be? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Remember your relative Elizabeth? It is said that she cannot have children, but she herself is now six months pregnant, even though she is very old. For there is nothing that God cannot do. I am the Lord's servant said Mary, and may it happen to me as you have said, and the angel left her. Ellen White goes on to say, every woman from way back in the history of Israel has hoped that their child would be the Messiah. And here's a young teenage gal, and God appears to her. Wow. Well, we know later that uh, as, as about the sixth month, or well, probably about the ninth place, actually, of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary, now becoming more obvious, slightly more obviously, well, you wouldn't know at three months, she goes to visit Elizabeth way off, from, not in, in, in the northern territory of Galilee, but down in the southern territory of Judea. And um, she had that encounter with Elizabeth. I'm not going to take time to read it. But they both had miraculous pregnancies. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Scholars generally agree that Mary was still a teenager when this happened to her. It was the hope and dream of every Jewish woman that she might be the mother of the coming Messiah. Almost every girl in those days was married by the time she was 20. More than that, Joseph already had at least six children, and maybe more, from an earlier marriage. Now, some of you are going to say, hold on, wait, what are you talking about? Look at Matthew 13, starting with 53. And this is when Jesus came back to Nazareth to preach to the people there. When Jesus finished telling these parables, he left that place and went back to his hometown. He taught in the synagogue, and those who heard him were amazed. Where did he get such wisdom? They asked. And what about his miracles? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brother? So how many brothers did he have? Four that we know about. Aren't all his sisters living here? Well, it would have to be at least two. So that means he had at least six children. It says all his sisters. So there are probably more. The law of averages would say he had, he had four girls and four boys. So Jesus was the ninth child in the family. So they said, where did he get all this? And so they rejected him. Wow. So now... My question for you out there, if you were God and you could choose any woman in the world to be your mother, whom would you choose? And do not forget about the ancestors of this couple. Think about Tamar, the Canaanite, Rahab, the, the, the also Canaanite, Ruth, the Moabite, Bathsheba, and you know what happened with her. Just to mention a few, look at Matthew 1, 3 to 6. So why do you think that couple was chosen? Hmm. Well, 
God doesn't make foolish choices. I don't know who her, Mary's parents were or exactly what the situation was with her, but God knew what he was doing when he chose her. I'm sure that's true. Try to imagine the scene when Gabriel appeared to Mary for the first time. As a teenager, Mary no doubt lived with her parents. What do you think she said to them about what had happened to her? Now there's a, there's a, a legend, we don't know if it's true or not, that he appeared to her when she went to collect water at a well. Okay, try to imagine it. Now, she goes to collect water, and while she, she turns around from collecting water, and this angel appears to her and says, guess what? You're going to be pregnant. And she walks home and she says, Mom and Dad, <laughs> what, what does she say? She's already engaged to somebody. A mom and Dad are going to say, have you been up to some hanky-panky? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And what did she say to Joseph? There's a lots of parts of this story that I'm... <laughs> when we get that panorama, I'm going to be watching really close to see exactly this, how this all took place. I'm sure God was so... He, he must have loved doing this. He, he knew what he was doing. He made wise choices. It's going to be very interesting to see exactly, okay, why did he do it this way? Why did he make these choices? It's going to be great. Well, it does seem that Joseph was doing everything he could to treat Mary in the best way possible. What did it say, remember? He was going to put her away quietly, right? So send her off somewhere so they won't know who the father was or how she got pregnant. She maybe won't be so embarrassing. Both Mary and Joseph seem to have been very faithful Jews. So, if Mary was three months pregnant when she went to see Elizabeth, or somewhere around there, two or three months pregnant, would anybody know that she was pregnant except her? Can you, de can you detect when somebody's three months pregnant? No. No, no, not unless you... If you were a physician and you examined her, you would know, maybe. But no, you wouldn't. So what does she do? She goes off to spend time with Elizabeth. And when she comes back, she's close to being ready for delivery. And she, what is she, God, God arranged that to avoid a lot of embarrassment for her. Yeah. Well, what do we know about the education of Jesus? The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself has spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. Yeah, I, I wonder, did Mary say anything to him about that? Did she say, let me tell you this? Well, uh, oh, by the way, this is what you said to Moses? How much insight did she really have? Yeah, who knows? As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 70. God was his instructor. Imagine that. Well, go ahead. God maintained perfect filial obedience. He, but he, Jesus did. He maintained. Excuse me. He maintained perfect filial obedient, obedience, but his spotless life aroused the envy and jealousy of his brethren. His childhood and his youth were anything but smooth and joyous. His brethren did not believe on him and were annoyed because he did not all of the things, act, excuse me, he did not in all things act as they did and become one of them in the practice of evil. In his home life, he was cheerful but never boisterous. He never maintained the attitude. Never gained. He ever maintained the attitude of a learner. He took great delight in nature, and God was his teacher. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, July 30, 1896. So there we have two comments, and, and you can see this found elsewhere as well. At least two comments from Ellen White saying that who was his instructor? His mother and God. God, his father. So he was instructed by his mother and his real father, and instructed by his surrogate father, I'm sure, too. 
How do you suppose God actually instructed Jesus? How much did Jesus tell his human parents about his communications with his real father? Think about the story of Samuel. You remember the story of Samuel? In those days when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord and the visions from him were quite rare. One night Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. I mean, think about this. Samuel is sleeping in the holy place? Not the holy, most holy place, I'm sure, but in the sanctuary where the sacred, sacred covenant box was? Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel. He answered, yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, you called me and here I am. He was trying to be helpful. But Eli answered, I didn't call you, go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know that it was the Lord because the Lord had never spoken to him before. So he got up and went to Eli and he said, you called me and here I am. But Eli answered, my son, I didn't call you, go back to bed. The Lord called Samuel a third time. He got up and went, went to Eli and said, you called me and here I am. Then Eli, uh, Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy, so he said to him, Go back to bed, and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had, as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, your, 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 your servant is listening. I'm sure he was, his voice must have been quavering there a little bit. The Lord said to him, Someday I'm going to do something to the people of Israel that is so terrible that everyone who hears about it will be stunned. On that day I will carry out all my threats against Eli's family from beginning to end. I have already told him that I'm going to punish his family forever because his sons have spoken evil things against me. E Eli knew they were doing this, but he did not stop them. So I solemnly declare to the family of Eli that no sacrifice or offering will ever be able to remove the consequences of this terrible sin. Samuel stayed in bed until morning. He didn't rush over to Eli with a message like that. Then he got up and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli about the vision. Eli called him, Samuel, my boy. Yes, sir, answered Samuel. What did the Lord tell you, Eli answered. Don't keep anything from me. God will punish you severely if you don't tell me everything he said. So Samuel told him everything. He did not keep anything back. Eli said, he is the Lord. He will do whatever seems best to him. So, you know, here's another example. We, it, another example God, of God talking to young, to some young person. And boy, well, he appeared in person. Yeah. Did he do the same thing with the Joshua too? Yeah. So uh, there's, you know. Early... Well, he looked like a soldier when he appeared to Joshua, but. Yeah. However it took place, there must have been a very close relationship between Mary and her son Jesus. So often, when young people have become teenagers, they want to rebel against their parents' guidance. There's no hint of that in the story of Jesus. But in order to instruct children properly and well, the parent or teacher must come close to that child and be a companion and a communicator. The true teacher can impart to his pupils few gifts so valuable as the gift of his own companionship. It is true of men and women, how much more of youth and children, that only as we come in touch through sympathy can we understand them, and we need to understand in order most effectively, in order most effectively to benefit. Education 212, paragraph one. How much the child retains and adopts into his life of what his parents teach him depends to a great deal on how he feels about his parents. Think of some of the instruction we got from Scripture about how to build strong family relationships. In fact, any kind of relationships. And there's a lot of verses there. I'll just read a couple of them. Proverbs 10, 31 and 32. Righteous people speak wisdom, but the tongue that speaks evil will be stopped. Righteous people know the kind thing to say, but the wicked are always saying things that hurt. And Ephesians 4.15, instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. And one more, um, Titus 3.1 and 2, 
Remind your people to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey them and to be ready to do good in every way. Tell them not to speak evil of anyone, but to be peaceful and friendly and always to show a gentle attitude towards other, everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, and wrong. We were slaves to passions and pleasures of all kinds. We spent our lives in malice and envy. Others hated us, and we hated them. Wow. Okay, in these few verses, parents are told to be patient, not to worry, not to become angry, but to trust in the Lord. Righteous people know what is kind to say. The truth which must be spoken must be spoken in the spirit of love. That love should not be just words and talk, but demonstrated in the life. Parents and children must learn to submit to rulers and authorities, not to speak evil of anyone, but to be peaceful and friendly, always being gentle toward others. They are not to criticize one another, especially not the husband criticizing the wife or vice versa. And Carrie, I think you have a couple of verses there. Yes. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's from the King James Version. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. And that's from the New King James Version. I used to tell that to my wife, and she always told me not to say that. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. Do we as Christian parents constantly seek to develop the fruits of the Spirit? Remember what they are? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, correction. Love, I'm sorry. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And in the King James, the last one is temperance. So what's the difference between temperance and self-control? That's what, it, what the word means. It's really enkratia, and it means yeah, self-control. Yeah, enkratia. Right? The Greek word enkratia means self-control. That's what it means. Yeah. Is this, is it, it says, seek to develop the fruits of the Spirit. Isn't it fruit? Isn't it a, a singular? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And with, in other words, it's a whole package. Yeah. It isn't uh, skewed. Would right. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mothers and fathers need to learn a lot of things, ideally, before they become parents. Look at Ephesians 5. I'm going to start with, with verse 21 here. Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as to the Lord, for a husband has authority over his wife just as Christ has authority over the church, and Christ is himself the Savior of the church, his body. And so wives must submit completely to their husbands just as the church, Christ, the church submits itself to Christ. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. So any wife who submits to her husband better hope that he loves her as, he loved, as Christ loved the church. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other perfection. Wow, that's quite a challenge, right? Um, look at 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not try to work together as equals with unbelievers, for it cannot be done. How can right and wrong be partners? How can light and darkness live together? So God is, is warning us, even before we enter in any kind of a relationship with, with someone, you know, pick someone who understands you, that, under, that thinks like you, someone who shares your spiritual values and so forth, right? And then a couple more, Romans 13, 13 and 14. Let us conduct ourselves properly as people who live in the light of day. No orgies or drunkenness, nor immorality or indecency, no fighting or jealousy. But take up the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ and stop paying attention to your sinful nature and satisfying its desires. And finally, a very good one, Philippians 4.8. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Wow. 
Parents are instructed to submit themselves to one another because of their reverence for Christ. While wives are encouraged to submit to their husbands, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. If, Christ, if husbands and wives did so, what a transformation would take place in Christian families. Christian young people should avoid marrying those who are not Christians. Orgies, drunkenness, immorality, indecency, fighting, and jealousy are not appropriate for Christians. And I don't know how the rest of you out there are, are viewing the news, but, you know, right now we have this problem of COVID. And where, how is the COVID being spread? A lot of young people getting together in drunken parties. And all of a sudden, guess what? You come back and a fourth of them or a third of them or whatever have COVID. What a surprise, yeah. you know? Mm. Okay, Second Peter 1, 5 to 7. For this very reason, do your best to add goodness to your faith, to your goodness and knowledge, add knowledge, to your knowledge add self-control, to your self-control add endurance, to your endurance add godliness, to your godliness add Christian affection, and to your Christian affection add love. And then the Philippians 4, 8, I already read that. Go ahead and read it again. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Goodness, Bible. Wow. In Deuteronomy 6, God, uh, I'm sorry, Moses gave very clear instructions to the children of Israel, and particularly to parents. Remember that Deuteronomy consists of three sermons or three dissertations or discourses that, that Moses gave to the children of Israel. They had traveled those 40 years. Down near the end, Moses made that mistake of striking the rock, and God says, because of that, you will not be allowed to go into the, into the land. They traveled up north. They conquered those two King, nations up there on the east, eastern side of the Jordan. Then they traveled back south again and, and camped in the plains of Moab. And they're looking right across a swollen, springtime, flooded Jordan River at the city of Jericho. And what happened there while they were there? Do you remember? There was that whole problem with the Moabitish women, and Balaam and all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. And so Moses, realizing what's going to happen, gave them three very clear disguises. Okay, I'm not crossing this river with you. I'm going to climb the mountain behind us, and I'm going to die on top of that mountain. So let me give you instructions. And he gave very clear instructions. Many, many of, well, the book of Deuteronomy is amazing to read, really. They were to teach their children in virtually whatever they were doing. Every activity was to be an educational opportunity. And here's what it says in Deuteronomy 6. I'm just picking up verses 4 to 9. Israel, remember this. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I'm giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you're at home and when you're away, when you're resting and when you're working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. And what do they do with that command as of the days of Jesus? Do you remember? The phylacteries? What were the phylacteries? Oh, yeah, those things they wear up on the scripture. Well, they wrap them around your arms, and there's a little box attached, and inside the little box is some scripture, and some another one that you wear around your head, and there's a little box on your forehead with scripture in it. And if you travel to Jerusalem, especially if you go there on a Friday evening, and you go oh, uh, uh, there to the Western Wall where the Jews go to, to celebrate and to, to worship, you go down there, and if you allow them to do so, they will put the phylacteries on you. They will show you how to do it, put them up, actually on you as you come down there to worship. Often in our society today, fathers are away from home trying to earn a living. Thus, Carrie? The child's first teacher is the mother. 
during the period of great susceptibility and most rapid development, his educate his education, I'm sorry, is to a great degree in her hands. And that comes from the book Education, chapter 275, paragraph 1. Upon fathers as well as mothers rests a responsibility for the child's earlier as well as its later training. And for both parents, the demand for careful and thorough preparation is most urgent. Before taking upon themselves a possibility of fatherhood and motherhood, men and women should become acquainted with the laws of physical development. They should also understand the laws of mental development and moral training. That's from Education again, uh, chapter 276, paragraph 1. And you, I'm sure, understand, I hope out there you understand as well, that um, we are finding out more information all the time about prenatal influences, about even effects a father has uh, if you drink too much before you conceive a child. Uh, it can affect things, and not only that, other things, and, and especially to the mother as she's as the child is developing in the moon, womb, all kinds of things that can happen. Um, even stressful situations caused by bad relationships. Wow. Later in their lives, children spend a great deal of time in school and the teacher becomes an added model for the children. Jim, I think you've got to work there. The work of cooperation. The work of cooperation should begin with the father and mother themselves. In, home, in the home life, in the training of their children, they have a joint responsibility and it should be their constant endeavor to act together. Let them yield themselves to God, seeking help from Him to sustain each other. Parents who give their, this war, excuse me, parents who give this training are not the ones likely to be found criticizing the teacher. They feel that both the interests of their children and justice to, to the school demand that, so far as possible, they sustain and honor the one who shares their responsibility. Book Education, Ellen White, page 283. My children, my children, my parents took this uh, comment very seriously. They told us as children, if you get disciplined in school, whatever they do to you there, you're going to get twice as much when you get home. I think I've heard that before. <laughs> Not from you, but <laughs> yeah. I can remember a long time ago. Yeah, and, and you know, one time my brother did something. It really wasn't bad at all. It was, he was teasing, I think, one of the girls. And the, and the teacher sent him home. We had to walk two and a half miles from home, from school, to school every day, and back from school. I can tell you, he walked very slowly. And that was a dirt road. Dirt road. It was, was a that, dirt road. Was that in the winter? No, the, I don't think this was in the spring. I think that was Shefflin's uh, uh, property there. No, no, this was this was the uh, Littler's property. Actually, oh, was a, okay. yeah. But, or our Bible study guide encourages us to think of how it was in that very first family. I want you to think about, think of Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, along with their sisters and wives, because there must have been some girls born pretty quickly, living together, working together, the entire human population in one family. There was a time when the entire human population consisted of one person, only Adam, and then two, two people, and now it's a family, one family. What did Adam and Eve say to their children about their time earlier in the Garden of Eden? Do you think they made their headquarters close to the gate so they could frequently go over and talk to the angels and Show their children, well, look inside there. That's where you're supposed to live. It's possible. I mean, what would you do? I'd want to Would you go as far away from the garden as you could? Not me. No, I'd want to see what's going on. I, 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 I'd want to point my children back to the garden as much as I could. Yeah. Well, how many questions that the young boys asked were answered with the, with the quote, the Creator God did that? How much did God teach Adam and Eve about what was coming in the future? 
We, of course, have the words of Genesis 3.15, suggesting that a Savior would one day be born. No doubt Adam and Eve thought that their first son would be that Savior, and Ellen White specifically talks about that. Eventually, that Savior was born to the Virgin Mary. We know something about his education. So why is it that so many young people today, even those raised in Adventist homes, turn away from their early training? Why do teenagers go through that rebellious stage? Starting to feel their oats as they get older. Okay, feel their oats. What does that mean? <laughs> but what's going on in their head? Try to think about that. What's going on in their head? Yeah. They're finally approaching adulthood. Yes. And they're saying, now, I need, to do, I need to be me. I'm not just a, not just a hand-me-down from my parents, right? And so in that process of thinking, I need to be me kind of thing, um, they, they develop a kind of re rebellion. And some, unfortunately, who, who have been raised in Adventist and Christian families go even further into sin than those who grew up in non-Christian homes. How frequently do parents and children share matters of the heart with each other? Think about that. Does a child feel safe to share hopes, fears, and troubles with his or her parents? I work with a group of young people at my job. They're, they're, they're becoming parents now, so they're not so young. But they belong to a group, and, and I did for years out in Africa. Um, where it was almost taboo for parents to speak to the children about sex. Yeah. You know, uh, why is that a problem? I mean, you know, it's a little, it's an intimate thing, and I understand all that, but... Well, it, it, in Catholicism, the original sin was having sex. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, Satan is with this perverse, uh, messed up, a lot of society. Yeah. Well, if we if we as parents are, are comfortable in sharing, you know, important things, difficult things to talk about sometimes, uh, like that, we share our hopes and fears and troubles. With, then the child will feel comfortable in, in, in sharing their hopes, fears, and troubles with his or her parents. Do the parents continually seek to affirm whether the child is doing is well, or does the child only hear criticism when he or she makes a mistake? Are the parents patient as the child stumbles along in learning new activities or responsibilities? Um, I'm sure you can all remember, as I can remember, children who had difficult, difficulties with learning one thing or something else and so forth. And I mean, how do parents respond to that? Do the parents gently guide the children to have a relationship with God? Or are they simply ramrod religious instruction instead? Are the parents secure and, and adult enough to admit to their children when they make a mistake and to ask for forgiveness? Or do they continually maintain a facade of perfection that the, child, the children see through anyway? Have the parents devoted time to give exclusive attention to their children? I mean, how many times do parents stop and say, okay, I have a lot of things to do, I'm busy, but this is the time I'm dedicating to my children. It's easier for mothers to do that than it is for fathers, because often the fathers are way more, and, you know, more responsibility in terms of finances and so forth like that. But we need to give that committed time to our children and say, you know, this is important. Do they play with their children when they're young? Has respect, and I remember when, when, this, when I, I grew up in a small Adventist community in a church school, and one of the most exciting things we had was once or twice a year we would have uh, some kind of a school picnic, and the parents would all be invited and everything, and we would play games with, like a baseball game with our parents, with our fathers. Not, not the mothers usually, with our fathers. But we did other things with the mothers too. And those are the most exciting things, you know, for kids. Here's a mom and dad are actually doing things with us, you know. Has respect been cultivated and earned between both parent and child? 
Do the parents apply discipline in a calm, controlled environment or impulsively in frustration or anger? And you know Ellen White says, if you get upset about something, you can tell the child, okay, we're going to talk about this later, but not right now. Then you wait till you calm down, you've had a chance to think things through, and then you come back to the child and you sit down, you call, in a calm method you say, okay, remember what happened? Why did you do this? Did it, it? What do you think we should do? What kind of discipline is involved? Well, do parents apply a discipline in a calm, controlled environment or impulsively in frustration or anger? I have a, a patient, a, a, a young woman, that scares me every time she comes in the clinic. She has two sons, and unfortunately she hasn't been able to maintain a male relationship with anybody. And she just yells at those boys, and you just, hmm, you wonder what's going to happen. Do they communicate words and actions of love and tender care to the child so that the child knows that they love him or her unconditionally? And the list goes on. That's from our Bible study guide. Both parents and teachers are in danger of commanding and dictating too much while they fail to come sufficiently into social relation with their children or their scholars. This is Ellen White talking. God talking through Ellen White, I would say. They maintain too great a reserve and exercise their authority in a cold, unsympathizing manner, which tends to repel instead of winning confidence and affection. If they would often or gather the children about them and manifest an interest in their work and even in their sports, they would gain the love and confidence of the little ones. And the lesson of respect and obedience would be far more readily learned, for love is the best teacher. A similar interest manifested for the youth will secure like results. The young heart is quick to respond to the touch of sympathy. Well, so what do we know about the childhood of Jesus? Not very much. Look at a couple of verses. Luke 2, 46. I'm going to read on down. On the third day they found, this is Jesus at the age of 12 in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. They found him, remember, I guess we, let's just back up a couple, just for some of you may not be so familiar with the story. I'll start with verse 41. Every year the parents of Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they went to the festival as usual. And what do we call that? When the young boy at age 12 goes oh, to his first Passover? Bar Mitzvah. Bar Mitzvah. Yes, yes. Yeah. When the festival was over, they started back home. And I'm sure that they were with their friends and all everybody was rushing and a big group were getting ready and probably people from Nazareth and other places that they knew well. And they were busy talking and they started off. And, and Jesus had always been so obedient. He was always there when they needed him. He never disobeyed. So they just assumed that he would be there. I imagine they got to nighttime. It was time for them to get the family together and have a meal and so forth. Where's Jesus? They didn't count heads. <laughs> they didn't count heads, is right. <laughs> and on the third day they found him. Yeah, wow. when the festival was over, they started back home, but the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. His parents did not know this. They thought that he was with the group. So they traveled a whole day and they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. They did not find him. So they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. On the third day they found him in the temple, sitting with the Jewish teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his intelligent answers. His parents were astonished when they saw him. And his mother said to him, My son, what have you done this? why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been terribly worried trying to find you. He answered them, Why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand his answer. So Jesus went back to Nazareth with them. It said that they were marveled at his uh, answers, but how about, I can imagine that he was asking questions too. Yeah. Yes. And then he was probably giving them the answer to, yes. to go with it. Fortunately for us, as you comment, Ellen White expands considerably on what happened on that occasion. At that day, an apartment connected, and I have to interrupt it just to tell you one of my favorite stories about this. There's a, an old, older black pastor that was preaching about this story uh, to his church. And he said, you know, as that discussion got started, I'm sure one of those elderly priests turned to Jesus and said, Son, how old are you? 
And Jesus hesitated for a moment and he said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I'm sure that didn't happen, but it, it's, it was true nevertheless. Well, at that day, an apartment connected with the temple, a room connected with the temple, was devoted to a sacred school after the manner of the schools of the prophets. Remember the days of Samuel and Eli, Elijah and, 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 uh, and, Sa and Elisha. Here, leading rabbis with their pupils assembled, and hither the child Jesus came. Seating himself at the feet of these grave learned men, he listened to their instruction. As one seeking for wisdom, he questioned these teachers in regard to the prophecies and to events then taking place that pointed, pointed to the advent of the Messiah. You suppose he had thought about the advent of the Messiah? I can, I can imagine, you know, here are these students, they probably thought, who's this young whippersnapper that just showed up here? You know, we're students here, why is he asking questions? And pretty soon the teachers all have their attention on Jesus because of the question he's asking. Yes. Jesus presented himself as one thirsting for a knowledge of God. The doctors turned upon him with questions and they were amazed at his answers. With the humility of a child, he repeated the words of Scripture, giving them a depth of meaning that the wise men had not conceived of. If followed, the lines of truth he pointed out would have worked a reformation in the religion of the day. A deep interest in spiritual things would have been awakened, and when Jesus began his ministry, many would have been prepared to receive him. If they had just paid attention yes. to what he told them when he was 12 years old. The rabbis knew that Jesus had not been instructed in their schools, yet his understanding of the prophecies far exceeded theirs. And this thoughtful Galilean boy, they discerned great promise. They decided to gain him as a student, that he might become a teacher in Israel. They wanted to have charge of his education, feeling that a mind so original must be brought under their molding. You know, we got to be in charge here, right? The words of Jesus had moved their hearts as they had never before been moved by words from human lips. The youthful modesty and grace of Jesus disarmed their prejudices. Unconsciously, their minds were open to the word of God and the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts. Do you think any of them later became Christian? I'm gonna... I don't see What? Weren't there quite a few after uh, the uh, Jerusalem? Can I take you to the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger, larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. How many of those do you suppose were there when Jesus was 12? I wonder, I wonder how, Jesus disappeared, went back to Galilee, obviously. Did they, how many times after that did they talk about this kid? Where did he go? What's he doing? What about those questions he asked? Yeah. If they were sincere, they didn't have a lot of other competing philosophies to de deal with. Surely we all know that Jesus was the very best teacher of all time. But do we recognize that he was also the very best student? What was special about his student days? Remember, first of all, that he was taught by God himself and the angels. He had a natural curiosity and hunger for any knowledge about God. He was an active and not just a passive listener, a learner. He absorbed knowledge and thought it out carefully. He discussed idea, his ideas with others, listening to their judgments, criticisms, and suggestions. So, what kind of family school did you grow up in? Think about what you learned from your parents. Was it anything like the story of Jesus? Did your parents treat you respectfully? Even play with you sometimes? Try to be socially very kind and considerate? I mean, many moms, it's, it, it, it's more natural for a mother to take this role than for a father. Many moms come, draw, draw very close to their children. 
So what did you learn from your parents? Were there, did you learn some things that you wish you hadn't learned? I, unfortunately, in my experience, uh, went to school for a number of years with a couple of kids about my age who ended up being bank robbers. And they had some other bad habits, uh, which I will not talk about. But you, you, when you get mature and you sort of look back on that and you realize those things were not good, we need to set those things apart. Um, did you do a better job with your children than your parents did with you? Oh, that's a, that's a challenging thought, wow. Um, yeah. How many of our habits that we learned from parents do we pass on to, their ki to our kids? Maybe sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes too much? Well, if it's good stuff. If it's good stuff, you can't, that wouldn't you can't be, be too much. That wouldn't be too much, would it? No. It's the bad stuff. I'm sure that one of the things that very often happens is if we have a parent that uh, has, has a tendency to lose their temper, it's so easy to do that same thing when, uh, when you know, when you have problems with your children. I was very fortunate because my father was a physician and I don't know whether it's because of his training as a physician or because of his training from his father, but he was always very patient. I was very, very fortunate to have a father who was very considerate, basically never lost his temper. So... You were lucky. What? You were blessed. I was blessed, that's right. So, what should we say to God about training our children? Would God guide us in teaching and training our own children? He can't force feed it to, it to us, but no. if we have a w willingness to listen and take instruction, and we appreciate what we learn from wouldn't, it. Wouldn't asking God to guide us in teaching our children be one of the greatest things that we could possibly do? And that's what Bible study is, yeah. you know, it, it, but it's, it's not a quick uh, uh, infusion. He, just think of how active this, uh, Satan is right now. He knows his time is short yeah. and how active he is. And we need to be the kind of parents that are, are trying to take every opportunity possible to get the right ideas into the minds of our children. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to have this guidance from you. We think of that very first family and what happened there, but especially we think of the times many thousands of years later when you came and you were a child and all that you went through. What a blessing you were to all those around you. May we be that to those around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.